Good evening and welcome to Woman. On December 28, 1968, for the first time ever, a woman's name appeared on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. Our topic tonight is female criminality, which has been increasing at an alarming rate. My guest this evening is Dr. Frida Adler, Associate Professor of Criminal Justice at Rutgers University. She is a faculty member of the National College of State Judiciary and a consultant to the United Nations Crime Prevention and Criminal Justice Section. Frida is the author of this book, Sisters in Crime. Welcome to Woman, Frida. Thank you, Sandy. Frida, how many more women criminals do we have now than we used to? Well, there are drastic changes in numbers. The female crime rate is uh, increasing at a rate three or four times that of the male rate. For instance, in the early 60s, females accounted for about 5% of all national arrests. Now they're up to about 15%. But I think what's even more interesting than, than talking in terms of numbers is talking about form, style. Uh, females used to confine themselves to what we called feminine crimes, you know, what they are, shoplifting and prostitution. Uh, women are no longer uh, committing these types of offenses as much as they are other types of offenses, what we used to call the, the masculine offenses, armed robbery, burglary, embezzlement, even auto theft. These are offenses that used to be a part of the male domain. Girls didn't do these things. And this is, these are the increases that are worrying us. So they are committing more violent crimes. Does that include murder, too? Uh, not particularly murder and aggravated assault. Uh, these are crimes that are a bit different in that uh, they're usually passion crimes committed within the family. Most crimes are committed for economic reasons. Most of these women want to move up. And uh, there are two ways you can go up. You can go up legitimately, as most women do, or you can go up the other ladder, illegitimate. And for those going up that deviant ladder, those criminal women, they're no longer contented to be what we call second-rate citizens or second-class criminals. I had, for instance, a, a group of girls I interviewed, a shoplifting ring, and they were interested in buying a new car. And they said, Dr. Adler, we could never buy that car on shoplifting $10 radios. So these girls rented a pickup truck, they backed it up to a platform of a, of a department store, and they piled it up with uh, color TV sets. You know, a quicker way to get the car, and they said they were taking the risk, they might get caught, and if they were going to take the risk, they, they wanted higher stakes. So we are seeing more and more of these types of behaviors. Is this true just in our country, or is it pretty much generally true? Well, when we talk about this, this rise in uh, female crime, it is true in many parts of the world. There are still some places where this is not true. In the socialist countries, for instance, and I, I've been there, I've lectured there, talked to the women, uh, the crime rate among females seems to be going down. It's interesting, after the war in 1945, when the females first entered the labor force, 50-50, the crime rate shot up. And now it's back down again. And I'm curious about this. I wonder, I think many things are involved. One of them being uh, a difference in psychological liberation and vocational liberation. Many of these women tell me, yes, there's 50-50 in the labor force, but I'm the one who goes home at night, and I have charge of the family, and I have charge of the house, and the cooking, and everything else. So the traditional roles still hold in many parts of the world. This may keep the crime rate down. That's an incredible explanation, I think. Lots of people, you know, when talking in terms of why this is happening, there are many people who are blaming women's liberation. And I don't know about you, but that bothers me just a little bit. Well, uh, it bothers me too. And uh, I'm even glad you asked me about it because I always like to try to clarify that one particular point. When you talk about a dramatic change, like we're talking about today, the rise in crime, we can't go back and say, this dramatic change is attributable to X, you know, the female liberation movement. There's just no way to do that. No one factor creates another dramatic rise. We're talking about a whole series of changes, you know, the whole cultural change that we're undergoing now. Um, in part, we would have to say it's attributable to the female emancipation movement, the change. And, and let me try to clarify what I mean by that. First of all, there are increasing opportunities for females in our country. Legitimate opportunities. 
but also there are increasing illegitimate opportunities. Remember, when the housewife was confined to the house, she was the shopper. When she went out and wanted to add just a little bit faster to the family budget, she became a shoplifter. This same woman now is found in a bank. She can become an embezzler. You know, there's no way you can embezzle unless you have some kind of fiduciary capacity, unless you're near the funds. The same way with bar brawls. Years ago, ladies, uh, most of us remember, went into the ladies' entrance at the bar. Well, you didn't get into a bar brawl when you were sitting back in the ladies' entrance. So, you know, in so many ways, uh, new opportunities for deviant behaviors are opening up to women. And uh, this is what I call the darker side. Most of the opportunities are very positive. But there is this darker side. Um, that's one of the things we're seeing. Uh, another thing that we're seeing is a more assertive feeling on the part of women. Uh, women are told to be more competitive uh, scholastically, vocationally, politically, economically, every way. Now some of them are going to be more competitive in another behavior, that behavior being crime. So that assertiveness has uh, another runoff, a darker side. But coupled with this, we have to remember something else that has happened as females become emancipated. And that is that they now have the same stress and strain and frustration that men have traditionally had. And this leads some of them to deviant or criminal behaviors. Uh, some of them who were protected or who were restrained by father, by husband, there are women now who are choosing not to marry. There are women who are choosing to be single parents. There are women who are choosing to support a family on their own. And it's not as easy as it looks once you get out in that mainstream. It's kind of a pressure cooker out there. And this leads some to deviant behavior. So that you have a very complex phenomenon going on with stress and pressure, increased opportunity, uh, women are out later, women are driving cars. There are all kinds of increased tensions and pressures. So we're dealing with, uh, uh, with many, many cultural changes, not just one. Frida, you really predicted that this was going to happen. Um. Yes, um, I, I'm not happy with the prediction. Uh, I, I felt that uh, by looking at the trends and looking at social change, that we would be seeing some of the changes that we are seeing. Uh, the change in organized crime, the change among our teenagers, the change, uh, changes that women in prison are undergoing. Uh, I, didn't, um, I didn't quite expect to see uh, the alleged as assassinations uh, in the papers all at once and revolutionary activities and and I didn't um, expect to see front pages uh, covered so quickly with females but I did think that this was possible in time given the fact that any behavior that a man is capable of committing or doing a female is also capable of committing she is no more honest than a man it's just that she's been treated differently in society. She has learned different things. She has grown up differently. And this behavior is now becoming more unisexual, more alike. So women are behaving more like men. The profiles of what women can do are becoming more like male profiles. When did you think 20 years ago of a, uh, a stevedore, uh, an airline pilot, uh, a, a brake lineman, these conjured mm -hmm. up uh, males, so did assassin. This was a male deviant role or, or, or legitimate role. Well, a lot of female behavior, though, was explained away by genetics. Isn't well, that true? Yes. Said, females are inherently this and that and, and so on. Yeah. And so therefore, I think that accounts for our being more surprised. I think so, especially when it was backed up by Freud and Tennyson <laughs> and Schopenhauer and Aristotle and everybody, you know, greater minds than ours tell us that we're the weaker, yeah. the gentler sex. But that's really a myth. And I think that uh, uh, the passivity is a myth. You know, what we're dealing with is culture. You know, we, we told our girls to be sugar and spice and everything nice, you know, docile, chaste. These were the qualities that really mattered. You know, these were what gave girls status. Like the young girls tell me now in the gangs, you know, I'm the toughest kid on the block. Well, this was something that gave a boy status 20 years ago. And now you find that girls are gaining status by being the toughest kid on the block. And I think that 
when the SLA house burned down out in Los Angeles, that some of these myths about female passivity burn down with that. That no longer uh, do we keep thinking of women in terms of uh, unable to handle a gun, unable to make bombs, unable to engage in some of the activities that we have seen her engaging in, and the rise in crimes, crimes that we never thought uh, females were either genetically capable of doing or whatever desire, so to speak, but she is stepping into many new roles, most of them healthy, but some unhealthy. How did we explain the occasional woman criminal of the past? You mean the Ma Barker or, yeah. the, or the Bonnie Parker? Bonnie Parker, okay. I was thinking of actually. Bonnie Parker. Well, the reason you even remember Bonnie is because... Don't tell me because of Clyde. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> but because she was so atypical. You know, yeah. for her time, she stands out. But like you said before, in 68, the first woman went on the FBI's 10 Most Wanted list. And now many have been on. So that, and you don't even know the names, and I don't know many of the names, but Bonnie stands out because for her time, she was atypical. This whole uh, reaction, the, what females are doing, I had a, a woman, for instance, a uh, bank robber, and uh, she kind of explained the situation to me. She said, you know, I started out as a prostitute, but that was against my upbringing. So I decided to rob a bank. Now, I couldn't quite figure that out, but she, that worked better for her. And she said, the first time I went into the bank, I went in and I didn't have a gun. And I got scared and I asked for change of a $10 bill. And the second time I went in and I had an unloaded gun. And the third time I went in, I loaded the gun and I had a successful, quote, job. And then she said, Dr. Adler, I went home, I turned on the radio and I was furious. I said, what happened? She said the local radio announcer said that the bank had just been held up by a man dressed up as a woman. And she was angry about this. She said, you know, can't a woman do this? You know, why did it have to be a man? And so you could see a change in this woman as to what her abilities were, what she could accomplish. Now, she didn't say to me, I'm liberated, I robbed the bank. But somehow she thought, that she was capable of doing it and that women could do that. A, a change in, in psychic content. Talk a little bit about the, the new revolutionary, the new woman criminal. I mean, it's, it's mostly political activism, isn't it? Well, women have always been politically active. You know, back to the suffragettes. <laughs> we talked about them before. Mm -hmm. The suffragettes uh, went home at night and went back to the kitchen and then made dinner and took care of the children. But recent political activism, uh, what we saw in the 60s emerging as student riots. We began to see girls in the student riots and demonstrations. But primarily in the 60s, girls were contented to be back at the, at the shop, so to speak. They ran the mimeograph machines, and they did the typing, and they made the coffee. But along about the, the end of the 60s and the 70s, they were no longer contented with these types of activities. They, as many of them have told me, they want to be, quote, where the action is. If the, the men are out there you know, throwing the bombs or making great strides, they don't feel that they should be confined back at the shop, you know, doing all of the preparations and waiting for the men to come back to say what happened. Now, you know, this is true of political activists, our middle class girls. This is also true of the street girl, of the lower class girl, the gang girl. And, and you may be interested in, in knowing just a little bit about the gang girl. There are two all-female gangs in New York City now, is that true? That's true, and an interesting group in London called the Granny Bashers. Oh, I hadn't heard about them. Well, just as their name says, they're a group of women, or young girls, excuse me, who go out at night and uh, they're armed with switchblades, attack elderly women. And many times the purpose is not even robbery just attacks on elderly women. They're called granny bashers. Now, what we're seeing here is another kind of a change, but in the same vein, this, the same style change. Uh, what we had were girls always affiliated with boy gangs. They would stand in as alibis. They would hold the weapons. Uh, they would say, Johnny would say, how could I have done the job? I was with Mary Jane last night. The women were there. Uh, they felt used in many instances. Uh, they didn't like carrying the weapons. There's a
different feeling that I get. I've interviewed many girls in gangs, and recently they tell me, we want to do, quote, our own thing. And uh, several weeks ago, I had a group of young girls tell me that they were actually about to challenge an all-boy gang. Uh, the boys had come onto their territory, so to speak. And I said to these girls, do you have any weapons? No, no, they, they didn't carry weapons. And I said, do you, you know, what are you going to fight with? And they showed me they had sharpened nail files. And uh, in the course of, of this, we talked about what is a weapon. And this certainly is a weapon. And, and I, I don't know how they dealt with this afterward, you know, the realization that this too was a weapon. But here was you know, a feminine tool, so to speak, but being used in a very masculine, aggressive way. You know, that change that we're seeing in there. I said, some people believe that the SLA was primarily controlled by the women. Well, I don't really know any more about that, but uh, from what I do know, uh, I would agree uh, from the texts that were found when the SLA house burned down, whenever it read men and women, that had been crossed out, and it read women and men. So in some way, the women were either primarily active or had become more active. And with some consciousness, obviously, too. I mean, aware. Mo you were saying earlier that most women are not aware of women's liberation, but that seems not to be the case with the SLA. Exactly. And so for them, I guess you could say that that's kind of a revolution within a revolution. You know, it's the revolution of the anti-establishment kind of thing. And then it's the sexual equality. So there are two kinds of fights going on with those women, a, a kind of a double barrel. It seems that some of the old concepts about women, if we're going to know how to treat them and if we're going to know how to do anything preventative at all, have to die. Uh, yes, and I think that's one of our problems. Uh, I uh, teach law enforcement people and uh, judges, and uh, I have found through time that uh, there is a, a a certain amount of paternalism, a different treatment on the part of the male to the female offender. And I think that this makes the female less suspect. We had a, a case, for instance, in New York City. We had 13-year-old girl, uh, nine 13-year-old girls in Central Park. And uh, they attacked a, an 80-year-old physician, a female, and uh, seriously endangered her life. Now, the report said that the police were following these girls in Central Park. Had they been an all-boy gang, I don't think the incident would have occurred. They would have been more suspicious. The police would have followed more carefully. They would have watched the actions more closely. What we are seeing is a kind of chivalrous attitude, if you will, a paternalism on the part of law enforcement officials from the first line of defense, the police, all the way through corrections. Most of the women that I come in contact with in prisons, the inmates, tell me that they would much prefer seeing and having a male all along the way, from, from the beginning with the police situation all the way through corrections, so that you have a kind of leniency that is not always healthy. You know, there are women who need protective custody. It's there also are, not safe for the policeman either, is it? Exactly. Though, uh, that's an interesting point because in my classes we discuss this and we talk about it and I see even a difference in age there with the uh, the older policemen uh, resisting the uh, the idea that females behave in such a way and then I had one of the younger policemen say to him how many high heels have you had in the back of your neck this kind of thing it's difficult for uh, many men to accept these types of behaviors because um, I think there's a song that says why can't a woman be more like a man and that's because you know men don't want women to be more like men and uh, there there are side effects to this uh, most assertiveness is healthy most women are going along fine but there is that darker side that runoff that more aggressive behavior that is not channeled but we have the same thing with men What's going to happen when more women are inter integrated into the judicial system? I believe that that's a good start because I think that women can judge other women more on the basis of fact 
than on emotion. And I would like to see women integrated at all levels. I think as police officers, they could do a great job. I was uh, riding with police women in squad cars, and I saw how competent I was in the South recently riding with two lovely young ladies, uh, plain clothes, in a pale blue car, long blonde hair. Uh, they were out on a special case, and uh, I said to one of them, how do you feel about agility tests? And, and she was very serious, and she turned around and she said, Dr. Adler, she said, I, I just think it's time to weed out all the weaker men. <laughs> and she, she wasn't being, a, you know, a uh, woman's liver. She w didn't say it in that sense. She meant it, that competency is important, and many women are very competent. But what's even more important, 90% of police work is not cops and robbers like many people believe it is. 90% of police work is social work, is help. It is really that, that image that we see of helping people cross the street. Um, and women are very, very suitable to this. But even in the risk-oriented work, they are very good. In fact, sometimes better. They still have an ability to diffuse violence in family schools, family arguments. They're excellent on rape cases. In many situations, females are good. but you know, advancing their good female prosecutors and defense attorneys. We certainly need more females in the correctional system, as the Joanne Little case tells us, that uh, uh, we'd be much further ahead to have women as correctional officers for, for females. Um, when we get to, to the uh, court stage, you find uh, different reactions on the part well, of judges. Isn't it true, though, that some of the judges are giving stiffer sentences to women? Yes. And that seems to be the one area where there isn't an advantage to being female. Uh, you're, you're right in that. I think it can go both ways, though. Uh, I think what you're referring to, and rightly so, is that, um, is that a judge will look at a, a woman and say, um, my God, how could she have done this? You know, what kind of a woman could hold up a gasoline station? You know, it doesn't fit in with his mental set of what a woman should do. That may be subconscious, but it's still there. And in that respect, uh, he will give her a more severe sentence. Or sometimes she will be sentenced indeterminately, you know, no e end to it. Because uh, historically, we have been told, even in some of our Supreme Court decisions, that women are more amenable to treatment. And Is so that true? No, that's certainly not true. Um, and it's especially not true with the discrimination that we have in our prisons today. The situation for females in prison today is so much worse than for males across the board through well, the Well, there nation. really isn't any rehabilitation going on, is there? I mean, That's right. And uh, it's no surprise, because when you think that on any one day, about 5% of prisoners are female, and on a per capita funding, they get 5% of the funds. And you need guards and food and mortar and bricks and uniforms and all of that. How much is left over for what we call rehabilitation? Now, I've gone across the country, and I, I go to one compound, and I go to the male side, and I see the men at least offered tasks, you know, engineering, learning different skills, data processing, et cetera. And then I can go, you know, just several yards away to the women's sector, and I find the women making artificial flower arrangements and working in the laundry and working in the kitchen. And these kinds of menial tasks are not the tasks that these women are going home to. And we can't expect anything but for these women to come right back in. Well, obviously, we've got a problem on our hands in, in, that we didn't heed, take heed about when you started warning us and other people. D are there any solutions, Frida? I mean, do we know what to do about this at all? Well, uh, I would say one thing. I would say that we should try to uh, stop talking about the relationship between female emancipation or, or female liberation and criminality. Um, I think that it's important to stress the fact that we're dealing here with two separate problems. On the one hand, there's a struggle for equality, and I'm all for that, for any minority group to have equal opportunities. Now, that's one of our struggles and one of our problems. But over here, on the other side, is the crime problem. Now, the crime problem is becoming more unisexual. 
male crime and female crime, as the past few months have shown us, are growing closer and closer together. That line of merge that says female male crime is slowly fading and it's becoming unisexual. So when we think in terms of crime, we have to think in terms of all crime, male and female. We have to gear the system up because there's another 50% of the population who is coming into the mainstream, who has the potential. It's now more important than ever to work on prevention, prevention for male and female. Would it be the same? It's getting more and more to be the same, yes. Do you think the Mafia will ever have an affirmative action program? <laughs> That's a good question. I, when, I, when I wrote Sisters, I, I had said that um, I didn't think the Mafia was an equal opportunity employer. I said it just a little differently than you did. But um, I, and then I said I didn't think we'd have a godmother, you know, because that's always a question for perhaps 10 years. But just a while ago, I, I was on a, a program on a panel with a female detective from the narcotics squad in New York City. And she said, Dr. Adler, you know, this one prediction is so off base. And I asked her why. She said, because I'm in the narcotics squad. And she said they are entering more and more, quicker and quicker. For instance, there were women who used to be contended to be the couriers in the narcotics ring, couriers, the messengers. Now these women want to sell. They want to import. So she said they're infiltrating the ranks faster than you thought. But you know, that doesn't surprise me. Because for one thing, tradition is changing and traditional roles are changing. And for another thing, the uh, mafia, or the organized crime, we should say, is a profit-making organization. And when they see competency, they're bound to take it. And many women are very competent in this new role. Frida, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for watching. Good night.